Hello and welcome to the second webinar of this new series brought to you by the Nuffield Family Justice Observatory and the Judicial College. My name is Lisa Harker and I'm the director of the Nuffield Family Justice Observatory. And in today's webinar, we'll be asking what the research evidence tells us about contact between children who are in care or adopted and their families. Decisions about contact are crucial, whether children are placed for adoption, removed from home through care proceedings, or voluntarily looked after by local authorities. Lockdown and social distancing measures over the last year have dramatically disrupted how separated children and families can spend time together, layering new challenges onto already complex decisions. Over the next 90 minutes, you'll hear from the authors of some important new studies which bring together the latest evidence on contact. You're also going to hear some examples of good practice from a range of professionals. And at the end of the webinar, we'll hold a Q&A section where I'll be joined live by Janet Boddy, Professor of Child, Youth and Family Studies from the University of Sussex, Beth Neal, Professor of Social Work and Director of Research at the University of East Anglia, and Samantha Clayton, who is Head of Effective Practice and Quality Assurance at North Yorkshire County Council. But first, here's Sir James Mumby, Chair of the Nuffield Family Justice Observatory, to introduce why we're here today. Welcome to this Nuffield Family Justice Observatory webinar series for the Judicial College. The Nuffield Family Justice Observatory was established by the Nuffield Foundation in 2019 to improve the lives of children and their families by putting data and evidence at the heart of the family justice system. All the people who work within the family justice system, judges, lawyers, social workers, CAFCAS guardians, policymakers, and more, share a common goal, helping children and their families to thrive in the future. But understanding how to achieve that ambition is limited by a lack of readily available data and research evidence, and too few opportunities exist for those involved to share their knowledge and experiences. The observatory exists to find and fill the gaps in our understanding of the family justice system, to highlight the areas where change will have the biggest impact and to foster collaboration to make that change happen. The center of its lens is on the family courts, but its focus extends far beyond this. To understand the support that children and families need before they reach family courts, and what happens after they've been through the family justice system. It is entirely independent, working with leading academics, reviewing evidence from around the world and commissioning new research where it is needed. During the pandemic, it has swiftly turned its lens on the impact of COVID-19 on the family justice system. Hearing from those experiencing the issues firsthand, not just professionals, but also importantly families, and identifying the opportunities and challenges abrupt changes to practice have offered up. Throughout this series, you will hear from a range of experts and others with experience of the family justice system on a range of issues, from the immediate impact of COVID-19 on hearings in the family court, to how best to manage contact between children in care or adopted and their birth families, and more. As a family judge, I need no persuasion of the importance of the Judicial College. In my new role with the observatory, I have rapidly come to appreciate not only the importance of research, but also just how valuable it is in illuminating much of this obscure in the working of the family justice system and in the us to see how things can be improved. I hope that this webinar series will be the beginning of a long and fruitful collaboration between the college and the observatory. Sir James Mumby there. The implications of contact for the well-being of children and young people separated from their birth parents has been the source of considerable volume of research in recent years, not just here in the UK, but around the world. Last summer, a new evidence review was published by the Nuffield Family Justice Observatory to examine the findings from 49 international studies. And during lockdown in March and April last year, two further rapid studies were carried out. Firstly, into how contact was being managed during the pandemic, and secondly, to understand the effects of digital contact on well-being. Here's an overview of the key messages that were identified by our review. When children are separated from their birth families, 
and are living in care, kinship care, or have been adopted. Maintaining relationships with the people who are important to them has significant impact on their well-being. Research tells us that the quality of the contact between them is crucial. Children want to have some choice about who they see and how that contact takes place. Where children are too young to express their wishes, it is important to consider how they might feel in the future. Their needs and views will change over time. The people that are important to them might include siblings, grandparents, other family members and friends. These people can all play an important role in supporting children when they leave care in the future. Good relationships between foster carers, kinship carers, adoptive parents and birth parents help to create positive experiences for children. Everyone involved needs to be clear about why contact is taking place and skilled professional support for everyone is vital to manage challenges and facilitate good quality contact. Contact plans need to be tailored to each child. They need to be flexible not formulaic and take account of changing circumstances and relationships over time. When managed well, maintaining relationships between children and their parents and wider family can support them to return home, build positive family relationships, help them to manage loss and separation or to make sense of the past. To find out more, visit our website. So let me say a few words about the format of today's event. There are many of you attending today's webinar, and for this reason, we will not be able to see you during the event, but we do want to hear from you. Please share your questions in the Q&A tab. All of your comments will be read by the Nuffield Family Justice Observatory team. We are recording today's event, and if you'd like to revisit any of the content from today's presentations, we will make these available on our website uh, and also to you via the Judicial College. But first, I'm going to hand over to Professor Janet Boddy and Senior Researcher Padmini Aya as they present their research on contact following placement in care and the implication for children's and young, be young people's well-being. I'm going to give you a brief overview of the evidence reviews that we did together with the University of Sussex on contact and the implications for children and young people's well-being. After that, Janet will talk you through the key findings from our work. In 2020, Nuffield FJO commissioned two evidence reviews. Both reviews focus on the implications of contact for children and young people's well-being. It's important to note that while there's a, a huge body of work out there on contact, um, we specifically focused on work which examined the relationship between contact and children and young people's well-being. To give you an idea of the scope of the evidence reviews, our main review aimed to answer this research question. So what is known about the implications of contact for the well-being of children and young people who have been separated from their birth parents in public law contexts? This was a mixed methods review uh, and we synthesized findings from 49 studies. The digital contact review aimed to answer a very similar research question, um, but focusing on digital contacts and covering public and private law contexts. This was a rapid evidence review commissioned in March 2020, soon after the first UK national lockdown, and we synthesized findings from 16 studies in this review. In both reviews, we included international, academic and grey literature, which was published between the year 2000 and 2020. Um, and the slide here summarises the kind of work that we included in the reviews. We adopted a broad, multidimensional conceptualisation of well-being uh, for children and young people in these reviews. This allowed us to account for subjective feelings, as well as the individual and relational aspects of well-being. And the key dimensions are summarised here on the slide, including uh, children and young people's satisfaction with contact arrangements and the quality of the relationships with both birth and placement families. Lastly, some key things to consider about our evidence reviews. 
None of the studies that we reviewed attempted to test the causal impact of contact on well-being. And that's not really surprising, given that there's no simple linear relationship between contact and well-being. Instead, this relationship is shaped by multiple related factors, including variations in the forms and purposes of contact, diversity within the care population, and children's varied pathways through care systems. It was also important to adopt a broad and dynamic definition of family, which Janet will talk more about shortly. We also wanted to share this quotation from uh, one of the studies that we reviewed, Wilson and Sinclair, 2004, as we thought it nicely summarised this, this complexity. So contact takes place within the context of variable and complex relationships. To isolate it from its context or see it as a simple variable with invariable effects is to misunderstand it. To pick up on this point about diverse pathways through and beyond care systems, this graph gives an overview of the reasons that children cease to be looked after in the year up to March 2019. And as you can see, there are a multitude of reasons here, including a planned return home, moving into independent accommodation, special guardianship orders, adoption, and so on. And we wanted to share this graph really to, to highlight this point that children and young people are moving through um, care systems in, in very different ways. And this will inevitably have implications for the quality of contact, the, the purposes for it, um, and the implications for their well-being. So that's just something to bear in mind as we go through the findings. So now I'll hand over to Janet, who will talk you through the key findings from these evidence reviews. Thanks, Padmini. So I'm Janet Boddy, and I'm Professor of Child, Youth and Family Studies at the University of Sussex. And I want to highlight some of the key findings to come out of our review of contact and well-being. So I'll focus particularly on the bigger review, but I'll pick up key points relating to digital contact as I talk through. The overarching message from both studies was the need to focus on quality of contact. We've talked in the research about a reimagining of contact as safe and meaningful involvement for the child. And I'll say more about what that means as we go through. Broadly, you can think of it as having three components. A child-centered approach. So that means a differentiated and dynamic approach, which takes account of children's rights, needs and perspectives, but also recognises that these might change over time as children grow older and circumstances change. It also means recognising that the purpose of contact will be different for different people and depending who's important in their lives. And that takes me to the second point, a family-centred approach, which recognises, as Padmini was saying, the distinctively complicated nature of family for children who are in care, adopted or in special guardianship. We need to think about what family means for the child and how that might change over time. It means working to ensure that birth family involvement is not only safe, but enables positive experiences of connection with key people in the child's life. And of course, that's challenging, which takes me to the third pillar here. Quality contact is well supported, enabled by skilled support and adequate resources. And support has to be respectful to all parties, even if contact is challenging, respectful for the child and their views and needs, and respectful towards the people that are important in the child's life. So I want to say a bit about how those three pillars relate to the specific messages from our research. The first is that to understand what contact means for children's well-being, we need to listen to the views of children and young people. We found a lack of research that had done this, but the studies that have listened to children and young people give a very consistent message. Children and young people want their views to be taken into account, and when they're not, that has negative implications for their well-being. Having said that, it's not straightforward for children, young people to express how they feel. And it's not always easy for adults to understand those views and take them into account. 
Of course, that's especially true for the youngest children, but it's true more broadly because of the complexity of emotions and relationships involved. So in terms of practice implications, a careful balance is needed. It takes time and resource to understand and respond to young people's views. And it also needs care to ensure that they're not made to feel responsible for managing those complicated and challenging relationships. Our next message is strongly emphasised in research that does include the views of children and young people, namely the need for a broad and inclusive definition of family. This wider involvement of family networks is associated with a whole range of wellbeing indicators. And there are correspondingly clear implications for policy and practice, not least about the need to recognise the importance attached to contact with siblings, but also the value of links with extended networks. So it's crucial to look widely at the child's family network and to facilitate their involvement when it's wanted by the child and safe. Digital contact might have particular value for that wider network, helping to establish and maintain links with people who might be living at a distance. And the research suggests that young people may particularly value digital contact because it's more immediate and less formal. The reviewed research also clearly shows the importance for child well-being of establishing the purpose of contact recognising that this will vary according to who's involved, as well as shifting over time. And there's a related point here. While there can be a lot of debate about how much contact is good or bad for children, we found no evidence that frequency relates to well-being outcomes. It's more complicated than that. It depends on the nature of relationships and the purpose of contact in the child's life. Quality is what matters. And unsurprisingly, professionals play a key role in establishing what the purpose of contact should be, what kind of safe and meaningful involvement is appropriate, taking into account all of these factors, which will shape questions of purpose as summarized here. And that takes us to our next recommendation. One size does not fit all. Contact plans need to be tailored and regularly reviewed. It's crucial that everyone involved recognises the complexity of the relationship between contact and well-being. So, for example, contact can be both positive and negative. At the same time, it can be highly valued by a child, but also worrying or upsetting for them. A key message from both studies is that well-being depends on approaches to contact that fit with children's everyday lives, but which also take into account their lives over time, during their time in care, as well as into their adult lives. So take a digital take example, it's, it's really, really important, important that approaches to digital contact take account of children's age and their existing digital practices. What are the modes of digital communication that they're likely to be familiar with, comfortable with, and how can you adapt and build on that, whilst recognising which aspects of their digital lives children might want to keep separate from family? If there's a mode of digital communication that they use with their friends, they might not want to use that with family relationships as well. They might want to keep some separation. So we know that contact can be upsetting or stressful for children, although that doesn't necessarily mean it's not very important to them or that they want it to stop. The research highlights a really important distinction between contact which might upset a child but still be needed and wanted, and contact that has the potential to re-traumatise children or expose them to further risk of harm. It's really important that we don't confuse the two. And that relates to a second point about family members' underlying needs and the implications of those for contact. Our review provides evidence that it's likely to be important for child well-being to provide support for birth parents following child removal. 
So the implications for policy and practice are clear. Again, recognising the dynamic nature of relationships and so that contact plans should not be static, but can be reviewed regularly. It allows that it might be necessary to pause contact arrangements, but also that there should be possibilities for review, especially if support with a parent situation means that risks change. And that leads me neatly to our final recommendation about the importance of skilled professional support. Support matters because good contact is positively associated with child well-being in relation to all of these important indicators. But it's not straightforward to achieve. As well as support for professionals, we found evidence that there would be value in providing support and training for carers and adoptive parents, as well as for birth parents and for children and young people recognising the challenges that they all face in navigating complicated relationships through contact, helping them to build their understanding and to build their resources to deal with the challenges that contact can involve. It can be particularly difficult for carers and professionals to set boundaries around digital contact and this can also mean that children and young people end up with too much responsibility for managing digital relationships. So that's an especially important area for training. In conclusion then, quality matters. The key question is not how much contact is good or bad for children, but how can we give children and young people the best possible experiences over time? That means thinking about how we can facilitate the safe and meaningful involvement of the people that matter to them in their lives. Digital modes can enhance face-to-face -face contact, but we need to take account of digital inequalities, things like access to technology, digital expertise, internet connections, and so on. And we also need to remember that there are qualities of face-to-face -face contact which just cannot be substituted in digital modes. When contact is experienced positively and managed well, it's associated with positive well-being outcomes in the short and longer term across a whole variety of domains. Equally, poorly managed contact is negatively experienced and crucially, can pose significant risks to children and young people's well-being. So support and adequate resourcing for that support is essential. The evidence that we've reviewed shows clearly that investing in contact in the safe and meaningful involvement of key people will pay dividends in terms of children and young people's well-being in the short and long term. Thank you. Padmini Ayer and Janet Boddy highlighting how quality is much more important than quantity when it comes to contact and how skilled support can ensure the best form of contact is achieved. Now, don't forget, we value your input enormously, so please add your questions in the Q&A tab. Next, we consider how children in care feel about contact. The Family Rights Group run a programme for children under 16 in care called Lifelong Links which aims to connect children with family members and other significant adults in their lives. Here's their chief executive, Cathy Ashley. Everyone needs people to turn to practically and emotionally, yet too often for children in care, the system has uh, broken down relationships and children are often left very isolated and that particularly is evident when young people leave the care system. So the aim of Lifelong Links is about building a support network of people who care about the child and the young person and who that child can turn to both whilst they're in care but also throughout their life. 
and that includes brothers, sisters, parents, grandparents, as well as wider family members, but also people who have affected them in their lives, such as former foster carers, teachers, maybe school friends, parents. Sandy is a young man who has spent uh, most of his childhood in the care system and Lifelong Link has uh, proved transformative for him, particularly in terms of uh, getting a much better understanding about his mother and also connecting to uh, brothers and sisters. Somehow it happened that Anne was going to help me go sort of looking for my family and that, and I was, I was well up for it. And I've got a lot of younger siblings, so since I was really, really little, it's, it's, I've always felt like it was like down to me and partly my responsibility to sort of get all my siblings back together. And the fact that Lifelong Links has been able to help me do that entirely now, I have I have some form of contact with all of them. And I'll, honestly, like I remember being 10, 11 years old and, and, and having to prepare myself for the fact that like my little brothers and sister might not want to see me. And, you know, that, that actually wasn't the case. And Anne, Anne's been really supportive through it all as well. Um, and she's been really going above and beyond to sort of help me build relationships that, that I didn't think I'd ever have. I think I was just sort of looking to meet them once or twice, maybe, so they're not just a face on Facebook, chat to them a wee bit, you know, find out a bit more about what my family was like, maybe what growing up was like, how, if, if, if they knew anything about my life when I was younger and, and stuff like that, or anything about my mum as well. My mum was actually probably the biggest one, because my mum died when I was nine, and then um, I didn't really, that, the last time I'd seen her, I was five, so I didn't have much memory of her. But I met my auntie, and um, she was able to really sort of tell me some things. Like, I, I don't know what her relationship was like with my mum, but what she what, what she could tell was really useful for me and was, was just really nice to hear. And, you know, I, I don't doubt there was bad stuff. I don't, I don't doubt there was, you know, issues there. But even just these, these wee little bites of, of, of goodness of, you know, what, what it was like for my mum growing up, it's really, really nice to hear. This film demonstrates the importance of foster carers playing a, a key part in the lifelong links process. We've always said that you should be able to keep in contact with the kids that you've had in your care so that uh, they know that you're still here if ever there's somebody that they want to talk to. Do you still think about the children I had? So it's nice to be back in contact with someone. One young person told me that she wasn't crying on the night now because she actually knew her mum was okay. She'd actually spoken to her, met with her. He knew that he was meeting his sister and his teacher said that he had his coat in his hand from nine o'clock till one o'clock till the picked him up. Am I going yet? Am I going yet? And there was just, there was just that connection, like, they'd never, never been apart, but he's never even met his sister. What we found in relation to life on links is that where it works best, where it's not just about finding uh, people who are important to the child, but where the local authority supports that, nurtures those relationships, doesn't see um, it in through the frame of sort of contact as a sort of bureaucratic process that needs to be done to comply with um, legal arrangements set by the court, but where they see relationships as being central to the child's current and future well-being and outcomes and they invest in that. Kathy Ashley talking about the important role local authorities play in supporting contact and nurturing relationships for children in care. As our research has highlighted it is important that contact arrangements are flexible and not formulaic. Here we explore some examples of good practice. At the very first instance, we um, complete a risk assessment and um, a, a working agreement. Um, and that is bespoke to the, the individual needs of the family. Um, and we look at any kind of additional needs, any kind of cultural needs, um, and um, any kind of additional support that's required. We offer guided parenting sessions. So if there is any additional needs of support, um, we tailor the sessions around those needs. We do try and encourage 
um, the relationship between the birth family and the foster family. And we try and create an atmosphere where that relationship can be really kind of scaffolded and encouraged from the first instance, really. The child is always at the centre of any decision making. Um, And we would, um, a lot of our older children actually um, do um, prefer some virtual um, to take place um, instead of the face to face. We use outside activities. Um, to often our older children don't want to sit in a in a room with um, their parents for an hour two hours um, kind of just chatting they want to be outside they want to be kicking the ball about um, you know doing things outside together Um, we we can you know if if a child likes baking or cooking um, you know we've got facilities here where that can happen as well Um, so it really is finding out what the, the child likes to do and then just, you know, trying to tailor um, any kind of activities, et cetera, for those sessions uh, in, in, in line with the, the child's wishes. Here in Blackburn with Darwin, we have a skilled team of family time support workers who have been hugely invested in to ensure that the family time that is delivered is psychologically and physically safe for children. That is so important. Children have experienced separation and trauma and incidents, and we need to ensure that children feel safe during that family time. Those family time workers are absolutely skilled in understanding the complexities and the issues that families face and have to work through. So the role is not just the supervision of family time, but it is alongside those parents role modelling that parenting support, that engagement and supporting families to achieve a positive family time and building family relationships. Those family time support workers have a strong understanding of child development and all the time are supporting children to have that attachment and that bond with the parents through those family time sessions but equally making sure that we've got that understanding of that wider family member and those other key and significant people in those children and young people's lives and they too being part of that family time. We try to look at each family very individually so the service that each family receives is is almost bespoke to their needs uh, and the the assessed needs of those children so we work very very closely with the allocated social workers um, we work very closely with parents and, and foster carers to ensure that we are hitting the right mark um, with children we listen to children and for children who are not um, yet able to to properly verbalize what they're feeling and what their wants are we are uh, undertaking those really um, evidentiary observations um, to ensure that um, if children start to um, look or talk about the fact that they've not seen the the grandmother or you know they would like to see another family member perhaps they have a step sibling that we can have those further discussions and, and when it is an appropriate time in that uh, in that child's journey we can start to put those plans in place and ensure that you know we are really making those sessions purposeful um, and and understanding the needs of each individual child within the family that we're providing family time for. We take a great deal of care, um, ensuring that um, our family time planning meetings, our discussions with parents and with children and young people make for that, um, that quality time for them to come together that allows that flexibility uh, and that understanding that um, we need to listen to children and we need to understand that their wishes and feelings um, uh, come through quite strongly uh, and we, we need to have due regard to that so that we are permanently uh, tweaking and turning and it is a, a very much a bespoke service for each, each child and family. Great examples there of how some local authorities are facilitating good quality contact and family time. Thanks to everyone who shared their experiences. Don't forget to add your questions in the Q&A tab. We'll be answering them live in the last half hour of the webinar. Now, COVID has had a huge impact on social contact between all of us in every way, no matter our place in society. 
But what about children and their face-to-face -face contact with families? Professor Beth Neal has been researching the impact that the pandemic has had on contact for children who are in care or adopted. Hello, my name's Beth Neal. I'm a professor of social work from the University of East Anglia. My talk is about virtual contact, using digital methods to keep children in touch with their families. And I'm talking about research that we carried out during the first period of the lockdown in 2020. The research was addressing two main questions. First of all, we wanted to find out what contact was actually happening during that first period of lockdown. And I can answer that question very quickly. Most people told us that they cancelled almost all face-to-face -face contact. Our second question, and what I'm going to focus on for the rest of this talk, is how were digital methods being used to keep children in touch with their families? And what did people think of that? I'm going to talk first of all about the experiences of children and obviously everything I'm saying here is the experience of children relayed by their parents, their carers and their social workers. So most people agreed that virtual contact was a reasonable alternative under the circumstances. It's a way of staying in touch and maybe better than phone calls or letters because at least you get to see each other. But in terms of how it worked for each individual child, that varied from not at all to really well. And loads of different factors came into play, such as the child's age, their individual needs, their previous experiences. What's their relationship like with their birth family? So starting at the younger end of the age range, people reported the most problems for babies. You know, that this form of contact didn't mean anything or very little to babies, that they couldn't hold their attention on the screen. They might even be confused by being able to see a parent, but not touch them, not realize where they were. So most problems reported for babies. At the other end of the age spectrum, people said there were quite surprising benefits to contact with teenagers. Lots of teenagers said that they preferred virtual contact with parents and other relatives. It could feel more natural, more normal, what they're used to, and maybe less formal than these uh, contact meetings that would take place infrequently. So a particular advantage of the virtual contact is that people could have it little and often. The next point is really about how safe the contact felt to the children. And again, we saw different examples. So some people felt that where children might have previously gone out of their foster home or residential home and seen their parent in the controlled environment of a contact center, to suddenly be seeing their parents on the screen within their home setting felt unsafe. It was like their parents were coming into their safe space and they reacted badly to that. On the other hand, other people told us that some children had previously appeared uncomfortable seeing their parents face to face. Maybe that was a bit too close for comfort for them. And to have their parents more removed and not actually physically present took the emotion out of contact and made it feel more comfortable for the child. So again, we really have to think about the experience from the child's point of view. One benefit of contact that several people raised was because, as I'll explain in a, min a minute, carers were often much more involved in facilitating the contact. There was a greater overlap between the child's family, their birth family and their foster family or their residential home parents and carers got to communicate a little bit more. They could see each other's spaces. And although that might have made some children feel unsafe, for other children, it could have the effect of making these two parts of their world more integrated, less separated. In terms of some of the practical benefits of digital contact, people highlighted the convenience. There's no traveling. You don't have to get in the car. And the last point, a really, really important point that so many people raised. In order for video calls to be fun for children, 
we have to get creative. You can't just plonk a child in front of a screen and expect them to be interested in talking to their parents or relatives for any more than a few minutes. They want to run around, they want to play, they want to show parents their toys. So building in creative and playful activities during the video call was said to really be beneficial. I now want to talk about a virtual contact from the perspective of carers, so foster carers, kinship carers, and adoptive parents. And what people told us about the use of digital methods here was that it did involve increased demands and responsibilities for carers. So some of the issues that parents talked about struggling with were around maintaining confidentiality and managing risks, you know, how to manage the settings on, on devices and on software, how to make a video call without revealing your phone number, for example, but also managing other risks during the call. For example, what if parents said things that the carers felt were inappropriate? How would they deal with that? In terms of managing that relationship with parents, as I mentioned earlier, some carers valued that. Um, you know, for example, it gave them more of an insight into the parents' home life. As this, you know, one carer said, it has enabled us to have a little window into their life. But for other carers, you know, they felt the tensions around those confidentiality issues, around those boundaries. So I think relationships are really important in contact. They underpin successful contact, but some people need help with these relationships. And the final area links back to what I was saying about children, the responsibility of managing children's reactions, preparing them for video calls, helping the video calls go well, you know, dealing with how children are feeling afterwards. So lots of new areas of responsibilities for carers. Next, I want to talk about parents and how they experienced virtual contact. First of all, I'll say that a lot of parents told us that their anxieties about their children increased during the pandemic. But even given this backdrop, generally most parents told us and most professionals told us about parents that parents showed a very high level of acceptance of the need for things to change for a temporary period. Parents were very pleased to see their children um, during video calls. I'd say certainly for parents that was better than not seeing their children's faces at all. An issue for some parents was just actually being able to get online. So in order for parents to benefit from video calls, some of them first needed help to actually get online. I would say that the most pressing problem that parents themselves raised with us and professionals raised was what is the situation of parents whose children are in temporary care who are undergoing parenting assessments and particularly for parents of babies who've been removed at birth or entered care at a very young age. The concern here being that a parent and a child cannot build a relationship over a video call. And I think that's a realistic um, understanding of what can be achieved with video calls. Now, when it came to carers being more involved in calls, some parents did welcome that. They really liked the, the chance to build a connection with the person looking after their child. But other parents did experience foster carers being in on the call as um, you know quite intrusive or taking away from their private family time with their children. The final issue again parents really reflected on um, the difficulties of engaging their children in video calls and this could be very disappointing and disheartening for parents who maybe look forward all week to this chance to see their child and then after a few minutes they wanted to run off and play and didn't want to talk to them anymore. So I think a lot of parents, you know, they needed emotional support with that, as well as needing some practical ideas about how they could engage their children. I now want to talk about the implications from this study and to talk about these in relation to the key recommendations about contact that have been developed through the 
program of work that the observatory have carried out. So the first recommendation is we need to focus on the quality of contact. So in the context of uh, digital contact, we really do need to think about how we can make digital family time child friendly and fun. There's lots of ideas out there that we need to draw in and not expect children just to sit in front of a screen and interact with their parents. In terms of the quality of contact, we do need to manage risks. But what I would argue about this, and I've often argued this about other forms of contact, our risk assessment and management has to be individualised and proportionate. So there may be some situations where even that virtual contact has to be very tightly controlled. But in other situations, that's not necessary. It would, there would be no risks in a child, for example, showing their parent um, some toys and different things around the foster home, and that would make the contact more engaging for the child. So I think blanket risk management policies are not helpful with digital contact, but risk consideration is important. There is a need to prepare and support parents and carers with digital contact to give them ideas about how it could run to give them a sense of realistic expectations and to help with those issues that I've highlighted earlier, which are predominantly around relationships and boundaries and supporting children's participation. The second recommendation is about listening to the views of children and young people. Who is it most important for them to keep in touch with? How do they experience the digital contact? What changes would they like to see made? What ideas do they have about what they would like to do next time they see their parent online? And I think as well as listening to what children say, we have to look at how children behave and what they tell us non-verbally during the meeting and after the meeting to make sure they really are feeling comfortable and they're not feeling unhappy or disturbed. The third recommendation is about recognising the significance of siblings, grandparents and the extended family. And I think there's lots of potential here with virtual contact, particularly um, for children of the same generation, siblings and cousins who are living apart. A lot of children are very used to playing online games with their friends at school. It can feel a normal and natural way for them to connect. So this could be a real option for siblings who are separated from each other, particularly where they're living a long, a long way away from each other and can't have that face to face contact very often. It can be maybe a way to keep children much more in touch. Why don't we bring grandparents into virtual contact as well? I mean, the, the other research that I've carried about contact highlights the many positives of involving grandparents. So I think we can think about that with digital contact as well. Now, I don't want to stereotype uh, older people and some grandparents are fantastic in using digital methods. But in our research, we found that kinship carers, many of whom were grandparents and foster carers, many of whom were older, often didn't feel as comfortable with digital technology as younger people. So that again, there's support needs there. The fourth recommendation is about being clear. Everybody's clear about the purpose of contact. Now, I think a particular issue here with digital contact is being realistic about what purposes you can actually achieve. So if um, the purpose of contact is for a parent and a child to build that relationship and build that connection. We have to be realistic that digital contact is unlikely or um, impossible to achieve that for very young children and babies. So if that's the primary goal, then we need to think about opening up face to face contact. The fifth and the sixth recommendations I'm going to discuss together we have to address those issues of digital competence and digital poverty. Secondly, we have to think about building positive relationships between parents and carers. Thirdly, we can think about opportunities to build, build connections between professionals and parents and young, young children as well. We heard lots of examples of this in the research as well. And finally, we need to think about 
those issues around family boundaries and really negotiate how the contact's going to work with people on an individual basis. And if there is a need for clear boundaries, which often there is in contact, we need to explain to people why they're there. That was Beth Neal reflecting on how much contact has changed during the pandemic and how important it is in this digital era to make sure that contact plans are tailored to each child. We know that the role played by care professionals to ensure good quality contact is crucial and has been hugely challenged by the pandemic. Let's hear from some of those voices now. For six months, I could not see my baby. At the start of the first lockdown, there was this just immediate response uh, pretty much across um, all of the local authorities we were working with where contact, face-to-face -face contact stopped. I think at the time, one of the difficulties was there didn't seem to be any guidance for professionals. So the parents we were supporting, who many of whom were halfway through proceedings, some of whom were right at the beginning or may have just had their child removed from their care, suddenly were not able to have face-to-face -face contact. That was for many parents, hugely distressing, given that they were just in care proceedings, they were already dealing with a lot of uncertainty. I really felt that the parents within care proceedings were a bit of a forgotten group, you know, for whom virtual contact was really not that easy. Uh, we had one mum who had had a baby uh, removed from her care, who didn't have a smartphone, and who was, you know, very um, up and down in her own life. And so trying to access her a smartphone or trying to get her somewhere where she could access that technology was incredibly difficult. Some local authorities have really prioritised contact and certainly prioritised it for the 0 to 5 age groups. Another local authorities have been really, you know, clear with us and said that we really, really can't do it. And for some, a lot of local authorities have, have talked about the fact that room space and access to contact centres has been a big issue. The other thing they've had is that, um, you know, contact centres have suddenly had to close down because of a positive test. And when that contact centre closed down, there seemed to be no alternative um, location for people to have contact. I think that this lockdown came with much better guidance. And I think there was more explicit understanding that contact between parents and children was a priority. One child was four months old, being removed, and had no face-to-face -face contact for six months. Video calls were made weekly, but on the first few face-to-face -face contacts, the child has been afraid, faced with parents who are strangers and supervising staff wearing masks. We have tried um, really very hard to maintain face-to-face -face family time for children right the way through the COVID pandemic. Um, we heard very clearly from our children and young people that the, the way that they wanted to interact with their parents and wider family members was so that they were in the same room um, talking to each other, able to see each other and 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 have that time. Um, the sort of almost set them apart from the pandemic because it was that it was that consistency we now don't have any children at all who are only experiencing their family time through a video call right at the very beginning what i always remind people we were taking everybody through this journey with us the workforce our foster carers our parents our children and young people felt confident that this was right for them that they, they had that reassurance from ourselves. And again, each individual case was discussed and looked at because we needed to make sure that this wasn't creating any additional stress, any additional problems, but where possible that was maintaining those family relationships. And what we decided was that it may not be face-to-face -face time three times a week. It might be that that face-to-face -face time with family members takes place twice a week and one session is done virtually. But the partnership working and children, young people and parents have been absolutely magnificent in working with us to drive this forward and make sure that those family relationships remain intact where it's safe and possible to do so. Contact has generally been virtual, which in my view is inadequate. 
Children aren't able to maintain a bond with their parents on screen, particularly young babies and toddlers. Throughout COVID, the, a level of face-to-face -face contact was reinstated fairly quickly once we could do that. And so we've taken all the measures um, around making the buildings COVID secure, about looking at how you manage the timings so people aren't overlooking. During the good weather, this was actually a lot easier to facilitate because people could go be outdoors and have contact, but, but be socially distant. Obviously, as winters kicked, that became impractical. Face-to-face -face contact has continued, family time, lots of pre-work, managing people coming in and out, managing time to do cleaning. You know, some of the virtual methods have been helpful in circumstances like uh, using FaceTime, using WhatsApp, um, being able to see people on iPads or devices, talking to foster carers. So I think there's been a range of things, but overall, probably most of the families and, and particularly with younger children would say that nothing really beats face-to-face -face contact. Some examples of the impact that the two COVID-19 lockdowns have had both on contact and the role of professionals. Thank you to everyone who took the time to speak to us about their experiences. Now, I'm delighted to have a message from the president of the family division, Sir Andrew McFarlane. The research that has now been displayed to you in the talks that have preceded what I am now saying couldn't be more important. Uh, I think that for a long time, contact with adoption has been seen as something of an add-on, uh, and because the received wisdom was that it was always letterbox contact, uh, there has been little scope for looking at a, a more bespoke model, uh, seeing the needs of individual children, uh, and uh, seeing whether the contact arrangements might be different from letterbox, or might develop over time uh, from letterbox. A key message from the research is that whatever the contact is, the important thing is that it is of good quality. Uh, and what suits one child, what suits one set of natural parents and one set of adopters in terms of quality will obviously uh, differ. And there's a need to be aware of that. There's a need also to listen to young people both young people who've been through the adoption process, but also, as best we can, the young people who are the subject of the particular cases. Early in March, the Family Justice Council held a series of evening seminars on the question of adoption uh, in the 21st century. And what was striking from those presentations was the emphasis on contact and on the need for children to develop in their adoptive placement with a sound and easy knowledge of their natural family and some form of link uh, with them. An adopter spoke and she described that despite being an adopter and despite being in law, the parent of the young person in her care, she described an approach of sharing that parentage, nevertheless, with the natural family. Now, whether that's right or wrong, or whether that's a template for the future, is uh, something that needs to be discussed. But it would be impossible to have attended those seminars without coming away with a clear view that um, thought is being given to developing our perception of what is right for contact for adopted children in the future. And it's right that we, we do that. The danger, I suspect, is that when a court is making orders for adoption, before that placement for adoption, and is making the contact order, it's inevitably making an order for a child who's aged three, four, five, or six. But in fact, 
the order that's made will probably be the order that's in place right the way through the whole of that child's childhood. Is that right? Should there be a review, either before a court or, or certainly within the structure of the adoption support services of the contact arrangements three or four years one minute down the line one minute. to ask the question, is the arrangement for this young person your positions, still the right arrangement? Or Janet, should it be changed it in some up? way? I would be very keen to understand how we might develop that thought uh, going forward. Can I end by thanking, as I do every time I'm connected with their work, thanking the Nuffield uh, Family Justice Observatory, and within that, the Nuffield Foundation, who fund all this research. Uh, for a long time, we haven't had the benefit of someone keeping an eye upon the development of research, drawing it together, and then transmitting it to those of us uh, who are uh, working with the cases on the ground day by day. This is extremely valuable, and an event like this uh, couldn't be more important, in my view, for disseminating key messages. Thank you. Now, I'm very pleased to introduce our live panel. Joining us is Janet Boddy, Professor of Child, Youth and Family Studies from the University of Sussex. Beth Neal, Professor of Social Work and Director of Research at the University of East Anglia. And Samantha Clayton, who is Head of Effective Practice and Quality Assurance at North Yorkshire County Council. Now we're going to try and address as many questions as we can, so please continue to put them in the Q&A tab. But let me start, I'm gonna pick up on uh, some of the questions that have already been placed in the tab and uh, start with this really important question. I'm gonna to come to Janet first. What do judges and magistrates need to know when exploring this issue? What questions should they be asking about the contact plan? What do you think, Janet? I, I think it's, um, you know, I think it actually ties to what Andrew McFarlane was just saying. Um, and it, it goes for me back to that principle of the best interests of the child being paramount. And so I, th I think there's a question, first of all, about um, the time frame for thinking about that and recognising the diversity of children and families that come into the system. If you're thinking some people come into care for very short periods of time, um, children come in at lots of different ages, including an increasing proportion in the second part of their teenage years. Um, so it's really important that we don't just think about the immediate period where the child's coming into the system. We actually think about that principle in the Children Act guidance of through childhood and beyond when we think about permanence. So thinking about family relationships through childhood and beyond is really critical. And then I think the other aspect which which goes with that and that consideration of best interests is the point that um, Beth made talking about contact in the context of COVID, but I think it applies um, more broadly than that, is about um, making an individualised and proportionate decision. So we need to consider if we're balancing the relative risks of contact, what will be the relative risks of not meeting a child's relationship needs through childhood and beyond. Um, and Beth, uh, would you echo those thoughts? Yes, definitely. And I think, you know, when we're making um, contact plans for children, we have to think about what, what the children are bringing. Who is the most important person to them to stay in touch with? Is there anybody they don't want to stay, stay in touch with is an important question as well. But we have to think about the whole system around the child. You know, the foster carers, how confident do they feel? Um, I think what we're looking for in contact that's good quality for the child is where the child can be part of both families, be part of their adoptive or foster family. So the extent to which foster carers and adoptive parents can manage that uh, birth family connection is really important to assess and to try and build. And also the extent to which 
birth parents and other family members can manage and respect the child's connection to their foster family or adoptive family is important to assess and build and support people with. So they're really important factors to take into account. And related to that, and I'm going to ask Samantha really, how can courts assure that the quality of contact that's being planned is 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 likely to be achieved? And you're, you're sitting on the other side as the local authority, but mm -hmm. what sort of questions should the court be asking about the quality of contact? Well, I think the court is uh, well attuned to receiving feedback from family time and um, you know, it's about, in terms of the quality of that, a lot of that is about recognition for the preparation and the building of the relationships between the parties involved to ensure that that is the case. Um, ultimately, the family time is about, to reiterate what Beth's saying, it's about meeting the needs of the child and um, keeping that focus in mind, really, in terms of what court uh, orders around the contact, um, about frequency, maintaining quality. And from our perspective as a local authority, it's offering the support to enable the parents to understand that and provide good quality planning, thinking about what the family time could look like um, and, and enabling that to go smoothly because it's obviously quite an emotional experience for people. And so offering some of that support, um, perhaps some containment around that emotional aspect, particularly in COVID when people have seen their children a lot less as well. Thank you. It, through the presentations, we heard a, a lot of information about the need to listen to children. Um, Judges and magistrates currently have limited opportunity to hear the detailed views about contact arrangements from children. Um, does that mean we should change the way that contact is ordered? What do you think, Janet? I, I think it, um, it I think it has to be built in. So it's I think there's there's no real getting away from it. And I I think the point that you know keeps coming up again and again is that it it's not necessarily quick or straightforward um to do that and that i think that's also one of the reasons why arrangements need to be regularly reviewed and checked in on um because it's you know children the emotions as um, Samantha's just been saying, the emotions involved in this are really complicated for children as well, who will be worried about the well-being of parents, who will be worried about the well-being of siblings. So we we really need to allow time, but also to allow that consultation with children about their views on this can't just be a one-off. It has to be a, an ongoing process, recognising how dynamic this is, how dynamic it needs to be. Perhaps I could put the same question to Beth. What do you think about how we you know, need to put in place uh, the ability to listen to children's views about contact? Um, I think I'd highlight certain situations where it's really important to check in with children um, and to review things. So um, this can be linked to the child's developmental ages and stages. So we know that in middle childhood is for children who've come into care and maybe been adopted or special guardianship when they're very young, that's something they might just accept. It feels normal. But when they get to around seven, eight, nine, all sorts of questions start popping up in their mind and all sorts of feelings come to the fore. And that might be a time to check in with children about what's happened so far and have they got any extra questions? Do they want anything to be different? I think another key time is adolescence where so many identity questions pop up. And we've had a lot of children in our research who have just really accepted the status quo with contact. Whatever's been set up for them, they go along with it. And then suddenly they're teenagers and they want something totally different. And it can be tempting to say to teenagers, wait till you're older, 
you know, things are tough for you right now. Wait till you're 18. You can look at your records. You can decide what you want to do. And if a child really needs something different when they're 13, we have to respond to that. Because otherwise, I think that's when children act independently and without support and they go looking for their families. And the third stage that I'd highlight is as children move into adulthood. So they're leaving care or for adopted people, they're coming towards the age of 18 and they are um, thinking, what am I going to do? Not what are other people going to do on my behalf? And the young people in our research have said that's a really important time for somebody to check in with them. And they value somebody, you know, who's maybe not their foster carer or adoptive parent talking to them so they can think about what they want to do as they move into adulthood. So I think if we think about these different stages for the child and also when circumstances change, you know, when birth mum has another baby, what are we going to do differently? If a sibling's placement breaks down, what are we going to do differently? So when things change, we need to look again. Thanks, Beth. Let me turn to another question from the Q&A tab. Uh, I'm going to come to Samantha now. Um, there's a question about whether there's anywhere um, that uh, people can go to recommend to parents and carers where they can get some help and advice in terms of digital contact, how to keep children engaged during digital contact. Is that something you've come across um, in the local authority or where would you turn to for advice and support about digital contact? I think the, um, the staff that we have who support family time are really skilled in working with parents to help them make family time be the best it can be. In the you know in whatever the situations they find themselves, I think that external external to that, I think there's a real limit to um, the support perhaps that parents could access f frequently and easily um, to to help to help them understand that and maybe work on what that could look like and how they would want their contact to actually, you know, work for them and their children. I think the key to it being successful and of a good quality is around the relationships that they have with the people who help facilitate and support them during their family time and contact with their children. So I think that, that the relationships are key really to that. And often um, that works better for parents as well, because they don't see some of the family time and, and contact supervising staff in the same manner, really, that they would see perhaps the social worker who has been involved in the court proceedings. So I think that can be easier. Thank you. And Beth, your research during the pandemic has highlighted the fact that um, the, the parents and carers have had to get to grips with this very quickly. Are there lessons that we can draw from that um, that, that are useful for thinking about how to manage digital contact in the future? Yes, I think so. I mean, we, you know, we had lots of examples of great practice. I think there's, you know, some contact centres took over the work of setting up and mediating digital contact. We've included some good examples about that, of taking a developmentally informed approach to digital calls. So thinking, you know, about the child's age and stage, um, planning with the parent beforehand activities that they could do, toys they could bring along, a book they could read. Um, it's important for the worker to prepare the parent to understand how long this meeting is likely to last. last. And if their child does want to go and play after 15 minutes, not to take it personally. So it's an approach that's all built around the child's developmental stage. And we've included a good practice example of that in our report, um, as well as some other detailed practice suggestions we heard from practitioners. So th there are good ideas out there to draw on. And there's also a team in Australia at uh, the University of Sydney, who've developed some useful um, 
guides for families about ideas to do in online activities, ideas for siblings, um, ideas for parents and children of things that they can play, you know, baking a cake together, reading a book together, playing peekaboo, treasure hunts around the house. So as I said in my talk, the more we can keep it fun and creative and interactive, um, the better it is. That's great. Lots of uh, lots of ideas. Um, right. Another question from the Q&A tab, and I'm going to come to Janet. It's a slightly different question, but an important one. So this session and the research we've talked about focuses on public law. But is there anything in common with relationships in relation to the arrangements under private law? So um, do you think some of the research mess messages we're drawing from public law arrangements might apply to families where children, um, where, where parents are separating? I, I think it's a really interesting question. We did a piece of um, cross-European research a few years ago for Nuffield Foundation, looking at contact in, I think, five European countries. And one of the things that um, in the Netherlands and Denmark, two of the countries that we worked in, that um, people talked about was thinking about this idea of shared upbringing between the foster family and the biological family and taking that kind of understanding from private law contexts of kind of shared custody of children following separation or divorce and and I think it's actually quite um I think it's actually quite helpful to think across the two in both directions actually and in the review that we did of digital contact um we picked up on studies from private law contexts as well and there are some common messages there for example about um using digital modalities that fit with children's everyday lives trying to understand what kinds of um you know digital modes they might use anyway um and I, I think the other kind of broad lesson I would say from this, and it ties to it ties to our argument about safe and meaningful involvement, is that if you have um, a child who, regardless of what the private law custody arrangements would be, a child who's living with one parent and not the other following separation or divorce, you would still have an expectation that that non-resident parent would be able to be involved in that child's life, to be informed about what's happening. You would try through mediation, for example, or whatever, to try and maintain an appropriate level of involvement. And I think that's a really helpful thing to think about in public law context. So for example, if it's not safe for a child to have face-to-face in-person contact with a family member, with a parent, for example, what kinds of indirect information sharing and so on would be would be feasible to do. So I, I think the kind of underpinning principle of safe and meaningful involvement and thinking about what kinds of safe and meaningful involvement are in the child's best interests at different points through childhood and preparing them for for life beyond childhood as we've been talking about for me that's the thing that really goes across and that includes i think really practically and it was a very clear message from our review um thinking about contact thinking about ways of involvement that aren't disruptive of other aspects of the child's day-to-day -day life. So you would think about contact arrangements that don't disrupt school or friendships and so on, that um, that take into account what, um, you know, what matters to the child from their perspective, not just their developmental stage, but their frame of reference, what's important to them. If you have a, you know, a teenager who's not able to spend time with important friends when all their the rest of their peer group is that's huge in a way that you know adults can 
easily forget how much something like that matters if we're thinking about the importance of education for children, planning arrangements so as not to disrupt that. Those are all things that span public and private law contexts, I think. Thank you. That's really helpful. Um, let's go to another question, and this one uh, is a, an important theme from the research, um, and that's about babies and very young children. Given that we still have COVID with us, what is the one thing that you would suggest judges and magistrates ask about care plans for babies and young children? And should courts be taking a more challenging line when digital contact only is offered, given the comments about the challenges of making relationships with babies online? I'll come to Beth first. It's a really tough one. I mean, one thing we haven't talked about yet today is COVID-19. And, you know, something that came out in our research is how afraid people were of catching that, how elderly, older foster carers with underlying health conditions. So that was a real worry a year ago. We're now hopefully in a different place and it is maybe, you know, easier, more appropriate to pushing back a bit on um, having that direct contact. So, uh, yeah, I think it can be questioned. I think we have to think about that 26 weeks and decision making in 26 weeks. If there is this period of time where that bond can't be built, um, maybe we cannot get children back home within that time scale. We cannot settle the time span. So we have to ask what, you know, if, if opportunities have been missed for relationships to be built, how is that going to be repaired? What's going to be put in its place? Um, how are timelines going to be extended? Yeah. Um, Janet, what was your thoughts about, about this? Should, should courts be taking a, a more challenging line? I, I would agree with Beth. It, it is tough, but I would say yes. I would say that, you know, if the if the paramountcy of best interests is there, you have to make judgments about relative risk and the relative risk to a child of at that developmental stage of not having access to those relationships and the implications for their rights to family life, I, I think are enormous. Um, and, you know, we we need to think about what the potential long term sequelae of that will be. Um, so I think, you know, we are in a different context now than we were at the beginning of the first lockdown. Um, I think even then I would have still been arguing for face to face contact with infants to be enabled, even if it was making use of outdoors and PPE and so on. Um, to find ways around it. Certainly that's been happening in other European countries throughout, um, although they haven't necessarily had the same infection rates as us. But I think because we are now in a different situation with vaccination, um, we have to be prioritising that. We have to be prioritising the child's relationship needs. We know the risks of transmittability through infants are, are pretty small, I think. So we we have to be thinking about that. Yeah. And Samantha, what's been your experience of, of managing contact with very young children during this, this challenging period? Um, I think I would echo um, what, what Janet really and Beth have said. It, it's been challenging. However, the contact has been the most difficult for young children um, in terms of engaging them. And so this was a group that we worked on first, really, in getting the contact back to being face to face. And I think even if perhaps the contact can't be at the frequency that people would like, increasing that now. I mean, foster carers are, you know, uh, an older cohort in general. And so, as Beth said, they have underlying health problems and there was anxiety around that. Um, and a number of birth parents also who have social anxiety um, and associated mental health issues have really struggled with COVID. But certainly I think, you know, I, I think 
continuing to not have face-to-face -face contact for younger children now with vaccination and things easing somewhat would be quite difficult to understand. So I think that, yeah, definitely the younger children, particularly when the plans are for rehabilitation and those sorts of things. Um, but equally, it might be that more time needs to be built in to do the repairing of what has been lost through COVID. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, we've got a few minutes left. I wanted to come to a, a, a really good question in, in the Q&A, which um, I think, Janet, you raised in your presentation about the need to distinguish between upsetting contact and harmful contact. Mm -hmm. Can you say a bit, a bit more about that? How do you distinguish between those two things? I, I think it's about... Um... I think it really is about thinking from a kind of child-centred perspective alongside very careful risk assessment, as Samantha and others have been talking about. Um, I think, you know, we have to expect that um, contact is em emotionally complicated for mm. children. It's, it's likely to be unsettling for them. It's likely to make them feel sad. It could make them feel confused. That's completely understandable. And in the same way, if, you know, if you go back to that point about the connection between public and private law contexts, if a child who was separated from a parent through private law came back upset or sad, missing a family member after they'd had contact, we wouldn't assume that we should go back to court and change the mm -hmm. custody arrangements and change the contact. So I think it's I think it's really important that we don't um, we don't leap to that conclusion that because a child might be upset, because a child might be sad, because a child might be acting out in some way after contact, that that means the the knee-jerk reaction should be to stop or to pause the contact. That doesn't mean that doesn't need work. That doesn't mean, you know, it's a good sig signal that the child needs support, that the carer, the foster carer, adoptive parent, whoever it might be, needs support to manage that distress in the child, that it needs careful looking at to understand what's happening during the contact. Is it that inappropriate things are being said, that promises are being made, that, you know, what is it that's that's causing the distress? So it, it needs to be taken seriously. It needs to be um, seen as a potential risk. But that is something that is, I think, understandable in the context of really complicated family relationships, which is different from a child being re-exposed to abuse, re-exposed to potential trauma um, through contact that's not being well managed and well supported. So that's that's the distinction that I would make. Thank you, that's helpful. Let me just ask um, Beth and Samantha if they'd wish to add anything to that. We've got about 30 seconds each, so tell me if there's anything more that, to add to, to, to Janet's comments there. I would just say we have to look out for fear. We do not want children to be frightened during contact. And I think we also have to look at, we have to consider sometimes that children's discomfort with contact is um, to do with the fact that the way we set it up is so weird and strange and not at all family-like. And if we can adjust that, it might enable children to feel more comfortable during those that time with their family. Thank you. And Samantha? Uh, just similar, really. I think that family time needs to be really tailored to the individual children to make sure they get the most out of that. Lovely. Well, that's a very good note to, uh, to end on. Um, I'm afraid that's all we have time for. But thank you to my panel. Thank you to Professor Janet Boddy, Professor Beth Neal and Samantha Clayton and to everyone else who took part in, in the, the webinar. If you'd like to download our reports, please follow the link that will be on your screen at the end. And if you'd like to sign up to 
uh, the regular bulletins from the Nuffield Family Justice Observatory, go to nuffieldfjo.org.uk forward slash subscribe. Thank you all very much for attending today's event, and we look forward to welcoming you to future webinars on behalf of the Judicial College and the Nuffield Family Justice Observatory. <laughs>